Hello and welcome to We Are Mamac, a series of interviews to showcase the staff and volunteers at Mamac. Uh, you may remember Jared Peetzmeyer from the, his first interview um, where we talked about his position as the Henry Malloy curatorial intern. This time around we're going to look at his role as a student at UM. Uh, Jared will soon graduate uh, from the art history program here at UM. And for his thesis, he's writing about an ancient Greek amphora that's within the Mamax collection. So, Jared, tell me, just what's so special about this? So, this amphora is, it's often pronounced, although I do hear amphora, amphora as well, mm -hmm. um, is, uh, is kind of a, a, a wonderful treasure in the collection and a, and a curiosity sort of mm -hmm. in the larger scope of what's in the collection. This is a roughly 2,300 year old object. So 2,300 years. Yes. Old. <laughs> yes. It was um, created probably in the 10 year span of uh, 290 to 280 before Common Era, um, which is the exact same time that the Colossus of Rhodes, um, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, was created. Um, and it does hail, uh, as we believe, from Rhodes. So this amphora, as it was probably leaving the island of Rhodes in transit, most likely to either one of the surrounding islands or potentially Alexandria in Egypt, um, probably full of wine, mm -hmm. uh, was sunk somewhere just off the coast of Rhodes. So it seems that even leaving the port was uh, treacherous. <laughs> um, and it was, uh, it was donated to the museum in 1959 and has gone um, relatively unresearched and, uh, and actually has had some incorrect information sort of passed on throughout the years about it. And so um, I've, I've kind of taken it upon myself to really kind of delve deeper into the history of the object and, and um, hopefully allow this object's story to be told um, to those who are able to access um, the collection here at the Mamac as well as um, the museum as well. Absolutely. So, so why exactly did you choose this? I mean, there are hundreds, thousands of uh, objects in the collection that probably need some more research. So why, why this one specifically? This will sound um, a little bit campy, but yeah. um, the object actually kind of chose me. <laughs> I was um, in here looking for something else and I saw it and I spent um, about a decade, a little more than a decade in the wine industry. So I'm familiar with Amphora. Um, I saw it down there, kind of started looking through our uh, object files about it. Um, and then noticed that there were a number of both inconsistencies and some issues, um, curatorial issues with it that needed to sort of be resolved in terms of our donor relations as well as um, preservation. And as I sort of started researching more and more into it, it started kind of speaking to me as if I was the one that needed to sort of take care of this object mm -hmm. and make sure that it um, sort of got its, its due um, and, and its propers in terms of, of both being available to the public and having its um, really wonderful and remarkable story told. So what have you done so far with it? Just, just research or have you done anything physical? We have not done anything physical with it and, and in fact there is only one sort of thing that, that might be done physically with it. Mm -hmm. um, and that is on the top of the handles uh, there are sea incrustations. Again this was under the ocean for thousands of years. Um, there are most likely two stamps uh, that Rhodian um, pottery factories or amphora factories would have put on there. One w would both indicate the priest um, that was sort of in charge at that moment, and the other would probably indicate the factory in which it was made. So we are, I am looking into you know, multiple ways of trying to see if we can identify if there are stamps there, and certainly if there are, how we can sort of access them because that will really give us a very definite idea of exactly when it was made mm -hmm. and, and where it was made. Yeah, and so that, is that also at the top of the uh, handles where everything yep. is? So. Right, both, there'll be one on the top of this handle and one on the top of that handle if they are present. It, it, it's not for certain that they are present, but there's, mm -hmm. a, good, there's a good chance that they are. Mm -hmm. Well, do you think that's gonna happen anytime soon? Uh, both with COVID and with any, any sort of project like this, things are slow moving. Mm -hmm. um, and we at the University of Montana don't really have the sort of tools in which to do that. So I've got lines in the water, if you will, to experts all over the country, including Canada, including people in Rhodes, trying to figure out, you know, what is the best way for us to even determine if those stamps are there? And then if they are there, what is the best non-invasive way for us to either A, remove those incrustations, or ideally, 
look through those sea encrustations with some sort of um, kind of x-ray or sonar mm -hmm. technology to deter determine what they are. Yeah, it's amazing what technology can do these days, right? Absolutely. Um, so you mentioned this was donated in 1959, correct? Yes. Yes, so um, do you know anything about the story before then, how that collector got it? Or Yeah, it, it's, it's a, and that's actually a remarkable part of the object's history. Um, it was not a collector, per se. Um, a soldier, or a Marine, I should say, uh, named Richard Seaman, Jr., was uh, stationed on the uh, USS Fort Snelling. Um, I don't know if you say stationed on a ship, but, um, and was in the Mediterranean Sea, at which point uh, he purchased this amphora from a sponge diver who dove down into the, uh, into the port, I assume, uh, and brought it up and sold it uh, to, uh, to Richard Seaman who then brought it back to the University of Montana and donated it to the what was then the Montana State Collection mm -hmm. um, in 1959. Um, there are even some more interesting parts to the story, which is that at that exact same moment that this sponge diver uh, sold this um, to our donor, the, uh, Sophia Loren was filming a movie in that exact same area called Boy on Dolphin, which mm -hmm. is about lost ancient Greek treasure. And there are, are many sort of... Uh, <laughs> parallel lines between the plot of that movie and the discovery of this amphora. And I've actually been trying to figure out, through contacting Sophia Loren, who is one of the only people living that mm -hmm. would know about it, um, whether or not those potential sponge divers may have been involved in the production of the movie as well, and really trying to figure out sort of that aspect of how it was found. Yeah, I know you probably bought it for, you know, pennies on the dollar, right? I would imagine so. And now so. here it is yeah. worth, uh, priceless, yeah. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, now that's a very interesting story, certainly. Just some, you know, some guy who happens to be in the right place at the right time, and, and now here we are. No, and, and it's amazing to have something so ancient, ancient in the collection. Um, does the, so how would that, this acquisition, would that reflect uh, I don't know, a certain collection policy at the time? Or, or what do you know about the collection policy here? Um, from what I've read in, the, in the, those editions of the Montana Cayman in the early early to late 50s and early 60s, it seemed as though the museum and the state was sort of in an acquisition mode of, if it's an interesting object and someone wants to donate it, we're going to take it by and large, if it sort of has any um, kind of historical meaning or validity. And so I haven't found, you know, kind of the, the edict that was written, here's what we do take and what we don't take, but it seemed as though curiosities, as they probably would have been viewed um, in the late 50s, were. Mm -hmm were just uh, you know, readily accepted by the museum. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then it was displayed for a few years, um, I believe, you know, 1960, 61, right in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you bring it on, I guess, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, so, and, and that probably reflects a little bit why it was a little under-researched and had some misinformation as well, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, so how did, how, did you, um, how did you know about the misinformation? I'm, it's probably written on a document, so how did you go proving that wrong? Yeah, so it had been... Um, put into our database as a third century common era and also uh, so a difference of about 500 years mm -hmm. um, and also a Roman um, amphora. Mm -hmm. So quite, quite a big difference there both in the, in the years and then the culture. Um, I simply started researching shapes of amphora and it did not look like to me that it was a third century common era amphora from mm -hmm. Rome. Um, and then I ended up um, contacting some experts, a very specific expert in, in Manitoba, who um, is probably the most preeminent expert on amphora in the West. Um, and he was able to identify it immediately as being uh, 290 to 280 BC. Great, great to have a resource like yeah, that. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> yeah, very close. Um, yeah, is there anything surprising you learned about it in your research? Or any, anything you weren't expecting to learn? You know, I've been delving deeper and deeper just into, uh, of course, the history of roads, mm -hmm. um, what I can find and the around that time period, and as well as just the history of amphora. Um, the, the writings about amphora from that, from that era are often technical, um, and they often don't really give sort of a broader art historical context. So I'm learning as much as I can about the technical side, and mm -hmm. then I will be trying to delve into finding some primary sources. They're in Greek, which I can't read, <laughs> um, to see if I can figure out kind of a larger cultural context um, for how they were produced, who produced them, you know, what those factories looked like, how many were going out every day, mm -hmm. uh, did they make it to their destination and travel back, sort of all of those. And, and this is research that's being done currently by experts all over the world. Um, but it's so ancient that there's not a lot known about it, and there's not a lot written about it. 
um, at least in accessible um, texts to, mm -hmm. to us in the West. So I have started to kind of compile all of the information that I can find and am hopefully at some point going to be able to kind of, uh, kind of boil that all down to a, like a really palatable way to express the story of this object, including uh, how it was found, how it was donated, including the sea encrustations, mm -hmm. and allowing a viewer to look at this object and really for themselves fill in the gaps as well and, and, and not dictate to them how to view the object, but, but rather allow them to view the object for what it is. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you feel like you're on maybe, maybe a forefront uh, art historian on the matter? When I look, when I've looked at the uh, uh, texts on preservation and texts on display and texts on, on, you know, sort of curatorial practices, um, the kind of old standard was a little uh, less what I'm doing. It was more mm -hmm. clean the object, present it sort of in the way that would allow people to experience, as, experience it as it would have been in, uh, in Rhodes at that time period. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in um, sort of focusing on viewers uh, esteem, essentially allowing them to look at this object, see the sea encrustations, and know that immediately, essentially, that that was underwater, and then start to create the story thereby. And then, you know, obviously, maybe see the text about the movie, maybe see the text about the ship, mm -hmm. um, all of these sort of things, and kind of um, interact with the object less from afar and less from a um, a perspective of being told exactly how to understand this object and more from the perspective of you carry with you the you know your your biases and your ideas of what this might be and you're able to apply those to that as well yeah it's classic show don't tell exactly right? and I, I do feel like the field I do see some writings and some texts uh, primarily from Europe and Scandinavia that the field is moving in that direction in, in some regards, mm -hmm. um, but there are still kind of the old standards of how to, how to curate and display things that would sort of be antithetical to how I want to present this object. Certainly. Uh, you mentioned that uh, all sorts of things, you know, there's, there's more to research this, there's more than just the, the actual clay itself. Right. Right. There's so much about the culture and uh, you know, the location and whatnot. Uh, have you ever researched anything around that area before? Or have Not, you been interested in it before? You know, ancient Greece has always sort of been um, the white elephant in, mm -hmm. my, in my educational history, um, it being so kind of vast. And uh, even though it's a pillar of sort of, you know, the liberal arts, um, it is a really vast and intricate system of culture and trade and philosophy and ego. So I've been reading as much as I can about, you know, the Hellenistic times and, uh, and Hellenistic roads and trying to really get an idea of maybe what that history was, was like. Um, so it's new for me and uh, it's pretty exciting to kind of delve into it, although it is a little bit daunting as well. Mm -hmm, definitely. So what have you been doing up to this point? So you're, you're doing your master's thesis on this, yep. right? So, what, so you're a, a sculptor, right, or painter? Yeah, I mean, I, I dabble in all the studio arts. I, I would say I probably paint more often than, than sculpt just from a perspective of, of space and, and, and whatnot. But um, painting is probably where I, um, and printmaking, I do quite a bit of printmaking mm -hmm. as well. But. So how is, how is the research in a museum setting your uh, curatorial intern position and your own artistic works? How do they all, all blend together and how does that complement your education? It's a great question. Um, you know, so I've got my studio practice and, and, and um, my investigations into my studio work, my uh, background, of course, being in art history, mm -hmm. and then my hands-on work with the museum, um, both with the Malloy Project and with any other um, kind of curatorial investigations I'm doing with the museum. And each one of those seems to, I should say, all of those resonate with each other. And it, it's, it's hard for me to sort of say this actually resonates in this way, but there's nothing that I do in any one of those sectors that doesn't seem to somehow have relevance to the other sector. And ideally, when I graduate, you know, I will have, you know, kind of my research component uh, with my thesis. I'll have some curatorial work here at the museum. I'll have, um, of course, my studio practice and then my art historical background that I think all kind of will make me feel as though I've got kind of a well-rounded um, education in terms of moving forward into the field. Certainly, yeah. Has it been difficult balancing all that? It has. I'm also a father um, mm -hmm. of a, of a three-year-old. 
Oh, and uh, great, great age. <laughs> yeah, and it's a wonderful age, and he's a fantastic <laughs> kid. Um, but trying to, to sort of balance all of that with being a dad and then taking care of myself and, and so on, it's, um, it is difficult, but all of those realms are, are rewarding. And so um, it's hard for me in my personality not to want to do all of it mm -hmm. every day. And I have to realize, okay, today I'm going to just focus on um, learning about the volume that this uh, was able to hold. And that's what I do that day. And then instead of trying to figure out the whole history of volumes of, of Amphora forever, I just work on that and, and mm -hmm. kind of compartmentalize it that way. Ah, break it up into steps. You know, yeah. like, like your uh, high school math teacher or your high school English teacher would say, you know, one paragraph at a time. Exactly. Um, yeah, so what, what are your plans for the future? Graduating uh, next month, is that correct? Uh, I graduate next semester. Next at semester. The end of, end so of next semester. Winter yep. 2021. Are you excited? Yep. I am, although I still feel like I will have so many unresolved kind of uh, projects that I'll be working on. Um, hopefully, I can continue to work with the Mac on the Malloy project, mm -hmm. potentially as maybe a postgraduate project or something to that effect. I would, you know, the, the uh, registrarial aspect of that project will be done, and then I would hopefully be able to engage in the more curatorial and um, exhibition aspect of the Malloy project. Um, I want to teach. I love teaching. Um, of course, I've um, been grading uh, a grader on Art 150 online course. And then uh, this semester, or in the summer, I'll also be assisting on the History of Photography, which is an upper division course. Um, so teaching is definitely, I should say, is hopefully in my future. Um, but I, I don't know. All doors are open. I love sort of every aspect of, uh, of yeah. anything. So you, so you plan on sticking around Missoula then? I hope so. I love Missoula. Great if there's place. a place for me here, some you know, somewhere where I can engage in these kind of um, activities, then I would love to, to be here. Yeah, Missoula's a great, great artist haven, if you will. It really um, is. Well, great. I, I, I thank you for your time. You, you were great to, uh, uh, with my questions. It's an amazing object, I gotta say, and it's crazy that it's in you know, Missoula, Montana. Right? It is crazy. All the, <laughs> half, half a world away. Yep. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, stay tuned, and you'll see this soon.